very small. I was the smallest kid freshman year in high school. I weighed 95 pounds, and so that would be considered the ninth grade, I guess. And, uh, um, so I was tiny, but I would uh, I love to impersonate uh, John Wayne. So I'd walk around and I'd go, well, we just rode our horses over yonder there. And it almost sound like this. I was tiny. But I, you know, I don't think any of us love our voices. Um, I, I, I mean, I was never that fond of mine. And uh, I remember in the early days when we had our answering machines, our phone answering machines, and uh, I would record my outgoing message and then I'd listen to it and I'd see it. You just, you're like, oh, I guess that's what my voice sounds like. Can you believe it? But uh, we all feel that way. Thank you for passing over my terrible impression of you, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> um, one of your first roles on one of my favorite shows was Quantum Leap. Um, what was it like working on that show? Well, uh, the, the episode of Quantum Leap, I Turn this off. There we go. Um, yeah, it was one of the first shows I ever did was an episode of Quantum Leap, and it was a Vietnam episode. And I played a Navy SEAL, and so we were actually flying in uh, a Huey helicopter with the doors open, where all the machine guns were hanging outside the door, and, um, and uh, on that very morning going to work uh, was the day that Stevie Ray Vaughan had been killed in a helicopter crash. And then I got in this helicopter, and our pilot was a... He'd flown three tours in Vietnam, he was fearless, and he was flying us and just, we're diving and we're hanging outside of the helicopter. And I thought, I'm gonna die in a helicopter the same day as Stevie Ray Vaughan did. But nobody will remember that I died. After that then, of course, you moved on to Seinfeld. Just, what is it like being on a show, just to kind of contextualize how popular that was, like that show was on 72 million viewers, and I think kind of, the equivalent now would be like to Game of Thrones, and at this peak, the most Game of Thrones ever had was 70 in million. What's it like being on? I think it was like 52% of all people uh, in America were watching Seinfeld. What was the, the fame and the, the kind of the notoriety of being on a show like that like? Well, it uh, it was a great opportunity. Um, I knew my wife and I it was our favorite show. We would sit down every Thursday night and watch it. And uh, I remember distinctly saying to her, why can't I get on a show like Seinfeld? And then two weeks later, I got to audition for Jerry Seinfeld and Larry David. And it was for the role of Putty. It was just supposed to be one episode. And Putty uh, was Jerry's mechanic. And there wasn't too much there. Um, I think I just made it more of a dimwit than they even thought possible. <laughs> and so Jerry and Larry responded to that. And brought him back for more episodes, but uh, it was, uh, you always knew when you were there that you were on hallowed ground. It's stage nine at CBS Radford, and, and, uh, and so I, uh, I actually always tried to avoid Jerry Seinfeld, and he is the most charming, generous fellow there is. But I just felt like if I got into a conversation with Jerry, all I would do would be to annoy him. So I wanted to hit my marks, get the laughs, and get out of there, and then have him think, oh, that worked, let's bring him back. He's also not a pain in the butt. Yeah. What's Larry David like to work where you kind of hear these, you know, various horror stories and, you know, interesting stories, shall we say, of work with Larry David? Yeah, I mean, you know, Larry David's a bit of a curmudgeon, but he's a funny guy. I think a lot of it, he, he plays it up. But he, um, he wasn't there much when I was there. He was there during the sixth season, and uh, I, uh, I remember, um, you know, him there then, but he wasn't there during the ninth season. So I was there during the sixth and the ninth season. I couldn't be there during the seventh and eighth season because um, I was on another show. And I'd signed on another show as a regular, and they wouldn't let me uh, out of my contract to do it. So, but then they canceled that show, and I got to come back, fortunately. It was news radio, wasn't it? No, it was a show called Dave's World with Harry Anderson. And um, uh, news radio was after, so I felt yeah. What was, because that has Joe Rogan on it, that had yeah. Phil Hartman as well, and a lot of voice on The Simpsons. Working with people like that, is that ever intimidating to, to an actor, or do you just, everyone's immediately appear? Um, is what uh, like working 
with somebody like Phil Hartman or with Joe Rose at the time and Andy Dick were. were well, I didn't. Um, see, the, the tragedy with Phil Hartman was actually the year before I came up. So it was a very strange season, you know, that the uh, you know the cast was going through a lot because uh, Phil, you know, died in horrible circumstances, and um, so so uh, John Lovitz came on the show the following season, and I did, and we. Uh, so, you know, there's no way to replace Phil Hartman, but they, um, they brought a couple of characters on, and that was us, and then that ended up being the last, last season for that show. Uh, but it was, it was a fun cast. I like the writing on that show. Yeah. You've made a, a transition into being one of the kind of most iconic voice actors in the world now, and I think one of the, the big parts of that is Kronk in The Emperor's New Groove. <laughs> <laughs> How was the process of going from, you know, on screen with things like Seinfeld to, to moving into things like, you know, you're essentially, I think, with the, the continuity, you're actually a Disney prince now. <laughs> <laughs> well, he wasn't exactly a prince, but... <laughs> um, I, I, uh, I grew up a huge fan of Disney. I grew up in a very, very strict household with three younger sisters, and my parents would only let us watch Little House on the Prairie and the wonderful world of Disney. So, uh, but Disney did mean an awful lot to me growing up, so it was a great opportunity to get to do a voice in a Disney movie. And so, uh, any of you all out there that do voiceover work or, or are interested in it, the one thing that I encourage everybody to do is just to be creative, because what I found with that in the, in the process of getting out, that was one of the first jobs I got, is that they could have four pages of a description of a character, but they still don't know what the character sounds like until they hear him. So when I saw, Disney's very secretive, I got four pages, I didn't get a script, just four pages of a cronk and an easement. Since it's animated, you don't know uh, if this cronk is an ogre, a giant, a robot, what I, through the, you know, through the writing, I, I could see that uh, he seemed to be a henchman and uh, a reticent one. So I thought to myself, well, he probably doesn't sound dark, you know, like a dark evil guy, because, you know, he likes to cook spinach pot, so I thought maybe he's a little bit, he's a little sweeter he's down here like that. You know, so that and like, oh, that's it. So oftentimes with producers and directors and writers, you have to, you know, bring something there, show them what the character sounds like, because they don't even know. How yeah, much of that was with Family Guy as well, and you play Joe, for the, the other the big role you'd be well known for. How much of that is kind of on the page, and like I said, they don't have a voice for the character, and how much of that is what you're bringing to it? Yeah, well, you can sort of take, you know, the character, we figure he's a cop, so, you know, Joe's, I figure Joe's just a little, um, he's a little, He's earnest. You'll find a lot of my characters all sound alike, so. <laughs> not exactly a chameleon. I mean, boy, he does sound an awful lot like Kronk. Joe's just a little more, you know, direct and serious. Is it true you're a mother trying to get family guy taken off the air? Yes. <laughs> uh, my father was actually in the monastery for three months before he decided that wasn't his calling, and then he went into medicine. My mother went to school with the nuns, and they did a job on her, so um, <laughs> they've, they've always thought that my soul was in peril for being on that show, and I have to explain to them the nature of satire. It is offensive across the board, but uh, yeah, so she, uh, she, I'll get things sent in the mail from the, the Parents Television Council, which is sort of like a media watchdog. They try to get shows like Family Guy off the air. My mom's actually tried to get me to sign petitions, and I have to remind her, that, like, you know what I do, Mom. You know I'm on the show. And then I go, you know. My mother owns, she says, my mother says, I, I own the answer to one person. I talk to him all the time. I said, Mom, I talk to him too, and he says that you do most of the talking. <laughs> and you can listen to Mom. We're Irish, we've got the Catholic guilt thing down, so we understand. <laughs> um, but you got to do uh, Drop the Puck for the Jersey Devils on the, on the back of the but Something you got to do, which I'm very jealous of, is you got to do a set list for Pearl Jam. That's right. Yeah. Yes, that is correct. I got to write a set list. I'm a huge, uh, I'm a huge Pearl Jam fan, and anything I do better, and uh, I have been for years, but uh, I did get the opportunity to write a set list one time. Uh, we were backstage at a show and, um, in Los Angeles, and I've got to meet a, a, a bunch, and 
and uh, so, uh, so uh, I've met so many people and worked with so many people, but he's the one guy, the one artist in the world that I, I still have trouble talking around. I never know what to say. And, um, but he's always been very kind and, uh, and generous. But it was, a, it was an interesting night. We were hanging out backstage, and, uh, and he gave me his uh, social distortion t-shirt. It was kind of a big deal. And uh, we hung out. That was the night he gave me his email. He said, write us that list. And my wife and I walked back in silence to the car. She knew that I was just beside myself. And when we got to the car, I took the t-shirt, and went like this, I went. <laughs> smelled it. And then I looked at her, and I go, it's clear. <laughs> I mean, I can't sleep with this if it didn't work. Um, but um, anyways, here's your girl, Jim.